Welcome to Allen University's first professional development symposium. Today, you will gain information on your career options and resources preparing you for graduate school admissions, and above all, you'll be motivated to brand yourself for success. Everyone, my name is Johnny Ellis, and I'm excited to uh, talk to you a little bit about Allen University. Um, I have a lot of great things to tell you, and let's jump right into it. So first and foremost, like I said, my name is Johnny Ellis. I'm originally from Billings, South Carolina, but lives here now in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm a graduate uh, of 2017. And Allen University was one of the greatest experiences of my life and literally set me up for great accomplishments, definitely. So how I got to Allen, um, it's a long story, but um, I'll just start it right here. I, uh, I was at Benedict College, brought in, thankfully, for, uh, for Coach Sean Jones uh, brought into uh, Benedict College and stayed there and played basketball there for one year. And when Coach Jones uh, got the job at Allen University, I came over with him. And that's how I actually got to Allen. But coming over to Allen, I, I'm telling you, it was one of the best decisions that I ever made because it actually uh, made my mind and my, my mindset focus enough to actually earn a degree and really uh, focus on academics, even though basketball was a way of uh, getting that that education, but it made my mind focused on uh, academics, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. So my time here at Allen was kind of short. I came over in 2014, came over in 2014 and graduated in 17, like I said, and um, I graduated with a business administration degree, and um one of the things that, that I can definitely say that helped me here at Allen University was uh, one of my professors named Melita Hayward. She was, uh, <laughs> she was very tough, but when I say she helped me so much, she helped me so much as getting my mind focused and uh, just, just pushing and, and getting the work done and uh, just, just thinking about it. Like it was, it's crazy because how my mindset was before I came was totally different for, uh, for after I left. So I definitely, um, I definitely appreciate uh, Professor Melita Hayward. Thank you so much. So um, my current job is uh, I'm an accountant for the U.S. Army, and um, I never would have gotten this without uh, my degree at Allen University. Um, so starting off, I acquired a um, a internship with uh, Eau Claire Cooperative Health Centers, and that's here in Columbia, South Carolina. I got an internship there. And literally right after I uh, acquired the internship, they hired me right on. So I stayed there for three years as a junior accountant just to get the experience and, and everything like that. So um, after three years, I transitioned over to the Army and um, became an accountant there. So like I said, I never would have gotten any of this without uh, Allen University. So I'm, like I said, again, I'm grateful. I'm definitely grateful. Um, projects and side jobs that I do have, um, I am a gospel artist also. So um, for anyone, just a shameless plug, <laughs> for anyone that uh, would like to uh, support, my name is Johnny Ellis, and my first new single that is out right now is A Prepared Place, and it's on all digital media outlets. That's a shameless plug for anybody that wants to uh, go support. So thank you. I appreciate you with that. Um, so my plans with my profession is um, I'm just filling it out right now. Um, like I said, I love accounting. I love business, finance. And... Um, I would love my my one of my biggest dreams is to um, become a um, CFO, a chief financial officer, where I be over all of the finances and all of the income, and just making sure everything is is working right and and coming together and gelling right. So that's one of my biggest things that I'm working towards is being a CFO of a company. So prayerfully that happens. Um, we, we're just going to see how it goes, but definitely uh, while you're here at Allen, make sure you take your education seriously because um, without an education, it's really hard out here uh, for anyone to get jobs without an education. And literally when you do have an education and a degree, it's still hard. So just go ahead and get that um, that degree. You're not here for nothing. So make, make the most of it here at Allen University. You're at a great institution, a great university. So make the best of it. Definitely make the best of it. And like I said, it was one of it was some of the greatest years of my life, um, just from basketball to academics to just the uh, the the student life. It was it was everything to me. It was everything to me, and I love it. And I love it also because they have a a, a Christian background. AME, 
they have a Christian background. I love that also. So yeah, you have it all. You have you have uh, academics, you have athletics, you have the Christian life. So just make the best of it, most definitely. So what Allen means to me, like I said, it meant a whole lot to me because it, it shaped me for my future and it uh, helped me to get the jobs of my dreams <laughs> and accomplish a lot and just check off goals, just check off goals as I go along. So um, I wanted to... Um, the, to talk about some core values that Alan uh, has, and this is what we go by, uh, integrity. We all know that you have to have integrity in this world. Um, your word is your word. So definitely have integrity, accountability. You have to be accountable. Accountability is one of the biggest things in this, uh, in this world nowadays, because if you're not accountable to yourself, you can't be accountable to anybody else. So you have to be accountable and definitely have respect. Respect is one of the biggest things also, respect. You have to respect your elders, you have to respect uh, your nagging balls or anybody like that. You have to respect them uh, just because of who they are and um, ahead of, they're ahead of you or on top of you. You have to respect them if you wanna get to the next level, definitely. Regardless of, I'm gonna tell you, regardless of how they treat you, still show respect, still show respect and excellence. Alan works in excellence. <laughs> they definitely works in excellence. So uh, whatever we do, make sure we work in excellence because we're a product of Allen University and faith. Like, just like I said with the AME church, they are big in faith. So um, you definitely have services to go to on Sundays. And not only on Sundays, uh, when I was there at Allen, we did Bible study during the week. And I was able to lead some of those Bible studies uh, during the week. So faith is big for Allen University. So like I said, enjoy your time here, uh, make the best of it. And I promise you, I promise you, I said again, I promise you, these will be some of the best years of your life and uh, shape you up to have some of the best years of your life. So my name is Johnny Ellis again. I thank you for your time and uh, just make the best of it and Godspeed to everyone. Thank you. If you wanna change the world, start off by making your bet. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. That you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if the shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout, and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African-American, one Polish-American, one Greek-American, one Italian-American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out-paddled, out-ran, and out-swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good-natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. 
If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle down to the Mud Flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive the freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up. Eight more hours of bone chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two, and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted, and somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope. The power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never, ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. Hi, everyone. I'd like to first start the session by congratulating you on your decision to apply to graduate school, or at least to begin your research into graduate school. So in this session, what we're going to be looking at is the uh, GRE, which is one of the potential tests that you would need to take in order to get into graduate school, similar to how you would take the ACT or the SAT in order to get into your undergrad. So for the most part, you all know the value of trying to uh, get your graduate school application up and running. You know the value of creating a good letter of intent. You know the value of creating relationships with your professors so that you can get good letters of recommendation. And often one of the last looked at things is the uh, graduate school test itself. So what we're going to do today is look at the GRE. What is it? So give you some tips on how to study for it and then also how to sign up for it. So just a little background on me. I have taken the GRE a few times. Um, I don't mean that to scare you. I just want to put that out there to show that I've gone through it before. I've gone through it a few times. So hopefully I can give you an insider's point of view as to what the test is going to look like from test day to actually taking it to studying for. So I'm going to get the screen sharing here so that we can get this going. So the GRE is going to be the uh, graduate school test that for the most part, most of you would decide to take if you are off to graduate school. Now, some of you may have subject specific tests like the LSAT for law school or the MCAT if you're trying to get into med school. But for the most part, the GRE is the more common one. So this is going to be taken by students who are in business, 
If you're a social science major, more likely than not, you're gonna be taking this one. And some law schools are beginning to accept the GRE over the LSAT. It would be up to you to do your own research as to whether your graduate school or your law school that you're looking to do would prefer the GRE or the LSAT. Uh, that may involve just taking a, uh, making a call to the graduate school itself, um, talking to your advisor or one of your teachers on campus to see what is the best route to go. So signing up for the test, the test is offered Monday through Saturday year round. You have to sign up at least two days before you plan to take the test. But generally speaking, you wanna give yourself a little bit longer to uh, sign up for it because the test times tend to go quickly. Um, when I was signing up for them, for the most part, it would have to be at least two weeks out. So you may want to look into signing up for the test earlier. You want to make sure that you are getting it early, not only so that you can get the time you want, but so that you can get the location that you want. Um, I remember one time that I took the test, I was very desperate in trying to get it done quickly. And so I gave myself about five days to get it done. And I ended up having to drive an hour and a half to get to the test location. So you want to make sure that you give yourself enough time to sign up for the test so that you don't have to spend your day worried about the drive along with the test itself. The link to register is in these slides. I will provide these slides if you would like. We'll talk about that at the end or I can work on having a link below. In order to register for the test, you must have a, an account through ETS. And I have the link, it's the second link, the sign in for test takers on here below. And again, that will be provided for you if you would like, or you could uh, email me. We'll talk about that at the end again. So what do you need to do to bring to test day? There's going to be two things that you need to bring. One is going to be what you've studied, what you bring with you in your mind, and the other is going to be a photo ID. So it must be an original government issued ID, so you can't make a copy of it. It has to be the physical one. It has to have your first and your last name exactly as you registered for the test. So I know uh, sometimes we like to sign up with nicknames or something like that, but with the GRE, it's not going to work. If you do not have a photo ID that has the first and last name exactly as the ID that you bring, they will turn you around. This ID must also include your photo and your signature. Make sure that your signature when you sign for taking the test is exactly like it shows up on your ID. I've been through that before where we all know signatures change and they looked at me side-eyed and made me redo my signature because it didn't match what my ID was. So make sure that you can create your signature the way that you have it on the uh, ID that you bring. And if you can't provide a government issue ID, then you have to contact tsreturns at ets.org at least seven days before registering for the test so that you would be able to take it without the ID that they're looking for. So when signing up, just make sure, like we said earlier, that it's a day that works for you. Uh, these tests do tend to get expensive. Um, they run about $200 per test, which I know is quite a bit. If that is an issue for you, I know that um, certain people on campus do have the ability to uh, provide a waiver or at least some sort of an assist when it comes to the fee. So if that applies to you, uh, talk to either Dr. Eldemeyer in the Office of Student Affairs or Ms. Kennedy over in Financial Aid. One of them should be able to take care of that for you. So if you do need to cancel or reschedule within four days, uh, you will not get a refund. So this is why you want to make sure that the test day works for you. If you know that it's not going to happen, something came up, an emergency came up, and you know that you're not gonna be in the right mindset or you're not gonna be able to get to the test center. If you do uh, cancel or reschedule four days or longer away from the uh, test, 
you will be charged a rescheduling fee, but you'd rather take that fee than uh, not show up or do it within four days because again, $200 and not getting a refund if you did not get a waiver is quite a bit of money. So you wanna make sure you have the right day. If you do need to cancel the test more than four days, uh, you will get a 50% refund. I know it's still a $100 hit, but it's better than nothing. So again, timing as soon as you know, as soon as something comes up, reach out to them so that you can get as much back as possible. All right, so what we're going to be looking at next is how do we study for this? So general study tips, there's going to be three areas that you're uh, going to be tested on. One is going to be writing, one is gonna be on vocabulary or, and reading comprehension, and the other is going to be math. Generally speaking, and this is not GRE specific, so if you're looking at the LSAT, MCAT, whatever graduate school test you're looking for, you should plan on starting to study at least six months before taking the test. Now, for the most part, a lot of the stuff you've already been started with your studying, with your time here at Allen through the classes that you've taken, so you've already got a head start, but studying specifically for the test, you should look at least six months out. The library does have access to GRE study books if you need them. If you're unable to get them through the library or the library for whatever reason isn't able to get them, there are other study materials out there and we'll talk about one specifically for math later on in this presentation. So the three areas that you're going to be looking at, one is the analytical writing. That's gonna be where you are writing um, based on whether you're trying to uh, show your persuasive ideas or whether you're looking at someone else's argument and trying to pick it apart. This is going to be the first part of your test. So each one is gonna take about 30 minutes. So the first hour is gonna be spent on writing. We're gonna talk more about this later, but for this part, the score is gonna be between zero and six. Zero saying you either left it blank or you just from your mind copied and pasted straight from an internet resource all the way up to a six, which is a perfect score. Verbal reasoning and quantitative reasoning, they'll flip flop between those. So you'll do a verbal, then a quantitative, and then you'll do another section with another verbal and another, another quantitative. So uh, don't be too concerned about that if it switches up. You're going to have two 30 minute sections for each, and then you're gonna have two 35 minute sections for each. So the verbal reasoning we're gonna talk about later and look at questions of later is going to test your reading comprehension, your text completion, and your sentence equivalence. So reading comprehension, you're going to be reading and then trying to figure out what the passage says. Text completion, sentence equivalence, you're going to need to know quite a bit of words, especially bigger words, know what they mean and know how they fit into a sentence. We'll look at examples of those later. And then the quantitative reasoning, this is gonna be your math kind of section. The verbal and the quantitative, those are both scored between 130 and 170. And you're going to get one score for those even though they come in two different sections. And it's a good idea coming into the test to know what your school is looking at with targets. So the score 130 to 170, whatever school you're looking at will give you a different target. So like a Harvard, Princeton kind of school, you're probably going to be looking at closer to 170 or high 160s in each section. Whereas a school, a larger state school like a USC, uh, North Carolina, they're probably going to be more high 150s, low 160s. And you can find this information on your graduate school website or you can just give them a call. They'll be happy to tell you what score is uh, average or what to target for your GRE score. All right, so the first section we're gonna look at is analyzing an issue. This is going to be looking at your ability to give an issue and then provide your opinion and be able to back up your opinion using examples. So we're going to look at an example here in a little bit, but essentially a general claim is gonna be made and then you're gonna be asked to write about it. So you're gonna be asked to give your 
uh, position, your opinion, and then you're going to be asked to give some examples in order to back up your opinion. So this is one where you can actually practice and study for before you walk into the test center. For this example, the scores are not necessarily looking for a right answer. They're just looking at how well you can write about your topic, how well you can persuade them about your topic, and how well you are able to back up your topic. Okay, so this is going to uh, look at how well you write persuasively and how well you can create an argument. So I told you all that you've likely already started studying for these uh, sections in your time at Allen. This is generally started through your English 101, English 102 classes when you are doing quite a bit of writing, when you're doing persuasive essays, and when you're trying to back up your information, your point with different sources. Okay, so just keep those skills that you were learning in English 101 and English 102 and just keep working on that. The GRE, as we'll see here in a little bit, does post all of these topics online. So you can practice before you get into the testing center itself. I know a lot of you love to see questions on tests before you get into the test. The GRE provides that for you. They give all the topics so you can practice these. So you can begin by practicing uh, just looking at a topic and then writing as best you can. And then as you get closer and closer to the test, start putting a time limit on yourself. Put 30 minutes to it because that's what you're going to eventually be asked to do is get your topic and then have a fully developed idea within 30 minutes. So work your way down, start on time and then keep working your way down until you get to 30 minutes and just practice, practice, practice. So how do you do analyze an issue? The first thing you wanna do is read the claim that's being made and make sure you fully understand the claim that's being made. One of the biggest mistakes is not fully understanding the claim and then just writing, 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 and then not getting to the point that the claim was trying to get at. So read it over a couple times. I know you're going to feel rushed with these 30 minutes. I know I did too the first time I took it, but if you practice, it's not as bad as it sounds. So I want you to read the claim a few times. Then begin thinking about the claim through experiences that you've had or through any research that you've done in the past. You all have done some uh, persuasive stuff through English 101, English 102. You've all done some research through your upper level classes. Think of different research that you've come up with through that and think of your own personal experience when it comes to this claim. Decide which position you would like to take. So again, they're not scoring you on the position you take, rather how you support it. And then decide what evidence you can use to support your position. So one of the easiest ways to do this is by creating an outline at the beginning and then writing off of that. So practice, um, practice creating an outline, figuring out what your claim is going to be, figuring out your different points of evidence, and then write based off that, explain the evidence in a paragraph or two to make your point. Sometimes if you have the time, they really like to see, and you'll see this with uh, really high scores, is that you not only argue your position, but you can see the other point of view and then be able to kind of explain that away as to why your point is the better one. So being able to take both sides of the argument and saying why one side is right and the other side doesn't hold water can only help you get a better score. Very important, there is no limit as to how long or short your writing needs to be. You should probably have at least three paragraphs, an intro, a uh, paragraph in the middle that shows the evidence that you're providing, and then a conclusion paragraph. The scoring guide, I have a link down below. It shows you the zero to six, what each number looks at. And then it also can give you um, 
different examples of what a zero looks like, what a one looks like, all the way up to a six looks like, so you kind of have an idea of what it is that they're looking for. All right, so we will get out of the slides here and we'll get online. Okay, so the pool of topics, again, I have this link or this link will be provided to you. So if you go down, it gives you the different topics that you can be looking at. So the university should require every student to take a variety of courses outside the student's field of study. That's a topic, that's one that you would create a claim for, think about your own experience, think about evidence that you've done, and then write about it. And as you can see, there's a lot here. So again, the GRE provides you every possible question that they could ask you in the analyze an issue. So the easiest way to study for it, or at least the way I found easiest to study for it was just scroll through one, randomly pick one, and then just start writing. If you've done this a few times, then create a, a 30 minute timer and just time yourself so that you can get that 30 minute time down so that you don't feel the pressure when you are in the test itself. All right, the next one is analyze an argument. So this is going to be one where an argument is provided to you and you are going to look at how well the argument stands up. So the best responses in here are going to be very similar to the analyzing issue uh, part of the test. You're first going to want to summarize your position. Do you think the argument is good or do you think the argument is bad? Generally speaking, if you think that the argument is 100% perfect, I'm going to be honest with you here, you're probably wrong. There's generally going to be something wrong with the argument. It's just a matter of figuring out where the, uh, where the argument doesn't hold. So with this, you want to begin by asking questions, making a prediction, or describing a scenario in the argument. Generally speaking, you want to look and see what are the assumptions that the person is making, and does the logic hold? So if they're saying this thing about one population and they're saying this other thing about another population, does that automatically mean that the two are connected? Look at a few examples to make your point, just like we talked about. If you have any real world examples with the analyzing issues, same thing with analyzing argument. If you can provide some uh, counter evidence to what they're trying to claim, if you can show a real world example of why what they're saying is wrong, that's perfect. Same thing as the analyze an issue, analyze an argument does not have a, a limit as to how long or how short it needs to be. Generally speaking, same thing, you want at least three paragraphs. The first paragraph saying whether you believe the uh, argument is right or not. You want to spend at least one paragraph explaining why you think that it's not. And then you want to conclude saying uh, why you thought what you thought was wrong or right with the argument. I do have a scoring guide. It's very similar to how the analyze an issue is graded. Again, zero to six, zero being either completely copied off of an internet source or you just didn't respond at all, all the way up to six to a perfect score of you nailed it on the head and you maybe took the other point as to why some of the stuff might be right and also how they could strengthen their argument if you wanted to say this is how they could be right. Okay, so again, you're going to look at the argument, you're going to evaluate it, you're going to analyze the claim. So when we talk about trying to pick the argument apart, the four areas you wanna focus on are, one, what is offered as evidence? So they're going to make a claim, what are they offering? Are they offering us, if you're looking at two cities, are they offering a different hypothetical city as their evidence? Are they offering uh, surveys, what kind of evidence are they giving? 
You want to look at what is explicitly stated or concluded. What are they saying their argument is? And what are they saying is the likely conclusion of the argument? Generally speaking, this is where you're going to hit the hardest with the analyze an argument, which is what is assumed and even what is assumed without proof. So this is going to be when you come to comparisons, they're going to assume that one population is the same as the other. That's generally a good place to start. Assumptions are going to be the hardest part of the argument that you should hit. It's generally where most of the arguments that you're going to see are going to fall apart. And then last, what is not stated but necessarily flows from what is stated. So what are they not claiming but they are implying. So this is another area that you should be looking at with analyzing argument. Okay, I have the links for analyzing issue and analyzing argument right here. Again, they will be provided for you if you would like. I'll get out of that real quick just to uh, give you another example of the uh, argument topics. So you're gonna see here you're going to be given a whole paragraph for an argument. And what you're going to do is you're going to read it, see those four things that we talked about, see where the argument falls apart. Again, if you look at it and you think the argument is 100% perfect, you're probably not going to be scored very well. So there's going to be something inside of here that you can pick apart, that you can say, no, this isn't quite right. Same deal, you're going to be given 30 minutes to do this section. So just pick one of these guys, write about it, figure out what's uh, going on with the argument, and then make your argument based on what they say. Just like the analyze an issue, work your way down to 30 minutes. Just like the analyze an issue, they're going to give you every possible argument that you could see on this test. So again, you have the questions to the test. It's just a matter of finding the answers to the practices that you do. Again, just if you're trying to study, just come up to a random one, start your timer, just start writing. And we'll go back to this again because there's one more thing I want to show you here. I did mention this earlier, but I just want to show you. They do have a scoring guide here. So it gives you what a six looks like, what they're looking for inside of a six, what a five looks like, what a four looks like. They also have sample responses so you can see what a one, two, three, four, five, and six looks like. So they give you up top here the question that would have been provided, and they give you actual past GRE responses from other students to show what a six looks like. And they also give you commentary from the scorer themselves. Why did they give this person a six? So this is a useful resource to figure out what it is you should be striving for when you're trying to get that five or six kind of score for your test. All right, the next section is going to be the quantitative section, the math section. So there's going to be four different types of subjects that they're going to be looking for inside of the math. There's going to be arithmetic, there's going to be algebra, geometry, and data analysis. So arithmetic, this is going to be uh, more your math 109 kind of stuff. Your addition, your subtraction, your exponents. The algebra, this is going to be more your math 111, or if you're in business, it's going to be more your BUS 391 kind of class. So you're solving for your unknowns, your quadratics, that kind of stuff. Geometry, this is going to be more your math 110. So things like uh, perimeters, areas, different shapes. So perimeters and areas of squares, triangles, all that kind of stuff. Knowing your Pythagorean theorem would be a good thing to know here. And then finally, data analysis. For uh, business majors, this would be more the tail end of BUS 391 into uh, 392.
for your social science majors, this would be your SSC 418, your elementary social statistics class. So again, you already have a leg up in studying for these through the classes that you've taken. It's just a matter of practicing to make sure you got it under control. So there's going to be different kind of types of questions that you're going to see on here. So the first type you're going to see is a quantitative comparison. So you're going to be given two quantities. You're going to be given a quantity A and a quantity B. And then you're going to be asked, are they greater or is one greater than the other? Are they equal or can you not determine the relationship here? Okay, so being able to know when something can be determined is a good skill to have here because there are times where the relationship cannot be determined is the right answer. So A, B, and C is not always going to be your choice. So it's good to know when you know what you can get out of this question and what you can't. Okay, so as an example here, uh, quantity A, the least prime number greater than 24. So our prime numbers are, again, the numbers that uh, are only divisible by one and itself. So the least prime number greater than 24, that would be uh, 29 because nothing goes into 29 except for itself. So quantity A here would be 29. And quantity B, the greatest prime number less than 28. So that would be uh, 23. So here, since quantity A is 29 and quantity B is 28, uh, three, we would put quantity A here. The next type of question is a multiple choice. You guys have a lot of experience with this where you only select one answer. So in this example, which of the following is furthest from the number one on the number line. Here, this would be uh, negative 10. That's the only right answer because that is 11 spots away from number one on the number line whereas 10 is nine spots away. So A would be your one correct answer here. The next type is multiple choice, but you can select more than one answer, okay? They're going to be very clear on the test as far as whether they're looking for one or multiple. So in the last one, we saw which of the following. So we know that one answer is going to be it. Whenever they're looking for more than one answer, they're going to say something like indicate all, like we see on this question. Okay, so here the integers that are multiples of two and three, that would be nine, 12, I'm sorry, that would be 12, 18, and 36, because two and three go into all of those. So C, D, and F would be the right answer. Now, when it comes to questions like this, these are gonna be all or nothing. So if you uh, get the question right, if you choose all the correct ones and none of the incorrect ones, you're going to get the question right. If you were to only choose 12 and 18 here and leave 36 out, which is another correct answer, that would be marked wrong. So you want to make sure that you are uh, very sure that you have all the answers selected that you want to select. The last kind of question is going to be a uh, fill in the blank. Okay, so you're going to be given a, a question just like this. You're going to uh, calculate it, and then you're going to just enter the question in. Make sure that if they're looking for something specific that you give it to them as they want. So in this example, we're looking at dollars and cents. So make sure you give the answer as dollars and cents that you would give as many dollars as you would need and the two decimal points for all the sets. If they ask for it to be rounded, make sure you're rounding to the right spot. If you do not, that will be uh, marked wrong and you definitely don't wanna be marked wrong for having the right answer. So make sure you know what they're trying to get you to give them and then give them just that. As far as calculating these, you are going to be given a calculator just like you see on the right side of the screen here. So make sure you know how to work a calculator like that, especially if you are using the computer-based test, that's exactly what it's going to look like. So if you need to have some practice with that, they, I believe they do have a calculator like this online that you can practice with. If not, just um, 
use a calculator like this, I'm sure your phones have a calculator that works and feels just like that. So make sure you get some practice with that. They'll also be giving you a piece of paper and uh, some uh, a pencil along with your um, tests so you can write stuff out as you need. So you can do the math on paper if that's going to be helpful for you. All right, so we are going to get out of here and I'm going to show you one more thing. So the GRE math review we have here and I'll provide this link also. So this is going to provide you with the different areas that each one is going to test. So you're going to have the arithmetic and you're going to have integers, fractions, so on. You're going to have the algebra, you're going to have geometry, and you're going to have data analysis. If you go into them, it'll show you what it's looking for and how to do stuff inside of that. And then it will give you examples also that you can work with. Okay, so it'll do that for the entire section here. So we've got the entire section of arithmetic. And then at the end, at the end of each section, at the end of the arithmetic section, at the end of the geometry section, they'll give you exercises that you can work with. So it'll give you different problems to uh, have you check yourself to see if you're doing good and where you may need to fill the holes, so to speak. They also do give you the answers at the end so you can check and see, are they, am I on the right track or uh, what's going on? And again, practice, practice, practice. We've all been through it where we uh, done math in middle and high school and then we get to college and it just kind of leaves us. So just make sure that you practice this stuff because again, it's stuff that you've seen in your math class as well here at Allen. It's probably just a matter of reviewing them to make sure you got them down. The last section is going to be the verbal section. This is going to test your reading comprehension and your text completion and your sentence equivalence. So your reading comprehension is going to be uh, taking a passage. Generally, it's going to be one to three paragraphs. And then you're going to be given about three questions on that passage that you've read. Okay, so when you're reading these, make sure that you have fully understood what you're reading. And then look at the questions and see if you got that. If you need to go back in, that's fine. But if you can just read it at first and then uh, figure out what the uh, passage was saying, that would be great. You're not going to be able to see all these questions at once. So it's going to be very similar to this where you see the passage and then you're going to see one question. You're going to move on to the next one and then you're going to see the next question. So it's going to be difficult for you to especially with the time limit that you have, see the questions that you're looking for the answer to and then read it. So read it first, make sure you got it, and then look on to the question. A great way to study for this is look at reading uh, different articles in newspapers, uh, magazines, online, whatever it is you're good with reading on, and choose topics that you may not be necessarily interested in. So if you're a business student, maybe look into uh, reading like a celebrity or a uh, fashion magazine. If you're into celebrity or fashion, maybe look into like a social science thing. So look into reading some articles that you may not necessarily be interested in and seeing if you can uh, get the comprehension down of what the article was talking about. If you're finding that difficult at first, then start with reading stuff that you're interested in. So if you're a business major, read the business stuff and then move into social science or something else. Just so that you can get that practice of reading and then being able to pull out what it is that you read. The next one is text completion. So you're going to be given a paragraph and then you're going to be given different answers here. Okay, so for uh, this one, you would be given A, B, and C for going one to fill in 
of this blank, you'll be given D, E, and F to fill in the second blank, and you'll be given G, H, and I to fill in this third blank. So very similar to the math question where there were uh, multiple answers, this is going to be an all or nothing thing. So if you get all of them right, the question will be marked right. If you get even one of them wrong, then the whole question will be marked wrong. So you want to make sure that you are 100% for sure with what you want to answer for each blank. Tips for this, um, generally look at sentence structure. So look to see if some of them are in present tense or past tense. Some of your answer choices are in present or past tense. And then read the paragraph to see is it looking for present or past tense. That's one good trip to look at, or one good trick to look at. Another is looking at the type of verb that they're, or the type of word that they're looking at. Are they lo looking for a verb? Are they looking for a noun? So knowing the word types is a good thing to know when it comes to these paragraphs. The last one is sentence equivalence. So you're going to be given a sentence, you're going to be given about five to six choices, and you're going to be asked to put in the word that best fits that sentence. Okay, so this is where having a good vocabulary is going to be essential to your score on the verbal part. If you don't have the strongest of vocab, like I don't have the strongest of vocab, there's a way for you to uh, build it up. So you can get a word of the day app. And when it comes to these apps, it's good to get an idea of what the word is, but you want to practice with the word. So if you have a word of the day app, don't just look at it and have that be the end all be all of that word. Look into using that word in a sentence as you go along for the rest of the day. Continue to use that word in a sentence as you go along for the rest of the day. As you're reading things in your classes, your textbooks, your articles that teachers ask you to read, if there's a word that you don't know, look it up and then continue to use that in a sentence. Same thing if your teacher says a word in class that you don't know, either raise your hand or go to them at the end of class and say, what's this word? I don't understand what it means or I don't know what it means. Can you help me out? And then continue to use that, practice that so that it stays with you. If you would like, the GRE does provide two practice tests for you. You will need to have an account like you did to sign up for the test. So you can get an idea of where you stand at the beginning and then after studying where you stand toward the end to know how you are progressing. So this is a good tool for you to know where you are and where you need to go from here. And I'll provide that link for you again if you would like. So general notes on the scoring. So we said with the uh, verbal and the uh, quantitative that the score is going to be between 130 and 170. So this is how that score is going to be determined. So first off, you can skip questions if you would like. So they're going to take you through question line by line, one through 20. If you know the answer, great, go ahead and answer it and move on to the next one. If you don't know the answer, but want to have a little more time to uh, think it over, you can skip the question. At the end of the section, they'll give you a little table of questions one through 20, and you'll just go back and go to the ones that you skipped. With these questions, make sure that you're not spending a lot of time on them. So we talked that each uh, quantitative and each uh, verbal section is about 30 to 35 minutes long, depending on when you are in the test. You're going to get 20, sec or 20 questions each section. You know that with math questions, some of those questions tend to take longer than others. You saw with the uh, verbal section that there was a reading comprehension, so that's going to take a little more time. You want to make sure when you skip these questions that you have enough time to come back to them. At the same time, you also don't want to spend too much time on one question because you want to make sure that you at least answer all 20 at least put a guess in for all 20 if you don't know certain questions. 
Make sure to answer every question. Your score is determined based on how many questions you get right. So when it comes to your score, a blank question is scored exactly the same way as if you answered it and it were wrong. So there is no penalty for guessing when it comes to the verbal and the quantitative section. So make sure you answer every question. If you see that you're going to run out of time and you're not going to be able to answer every question to the best of your ability by thinking it out or by being able to read the passage that you need to, at least answer it. You have a better shot of getting it right if you at least throw something in there as opposed to not. And again, there's no penalty for being wrong, so you may as well just answer every question that you can. You will get two scheduled breaks during your test. They tend to run between the, um, the writing section and then your first verbal or quantitative section. And then they tend to go again between your two verbals and your two quantitatives. You can take a break outside of that, but just know that your time will still be running. So you want to make sure that you take your breaks when they're provided to you so that you're not penalized with time. Each of these breaks is 10 minutes. So if you take longer than 10 minutes, your time for the next session will begin whether you're there or not. So make sure that you have uh, given yourself enough time to get out and get back into the testing center at the time that they provide the breaks. Also, because these breaks are the way they are, um, make sure you don't drink too much water so that you're running in and out. Make sure that if you uh, feel like the paper that they provide you is not enough, that you try and get some beforehand so that you don't waste time doing that. And one other thing, um, you may notice on the test between the two quantitative and between the two verbal sections, that the section may seem harder the second time around. That's okay. If you're doing the computer section, what it does is it looks at how well you did the first go around, and then it will uh, provide questions for you based on how you did. So if you did really well on the first round, the computer is going to say, okay, this person really knows what they're doing. Let's give them a slightly harder question. So if it does look like it's getting harder, that's okay. That just meant that you did really well the second time around. That also means that your score is likely going to be higher if you're doing well on the second set of those questions also. So don't, don't be concerned if it looks like they got harder the second time around. That is a normal thing. That's actually a good thing. That means you did well the first go around. So don't be concerned if you notice that. So when it comes to the GRE, you are able to report your scores once the test is done. So at the end of the test, you will be asked if you would like to report your scores. So this is where you kind of have a feel of knowing how you did. You're going to be asked to uh, report your scores before you actually see what the scores of your verbal and your quantitative were. So you want to make sure you kind of have a feel of how you're doing between or during the test so that you know kind of is this test going really well or is it not going so hot and then you can determine based off that. Knowing which schools you would like to report your scores to is important going in. So at the end, when it asks you to report your scores, it's going to give you a list of schools for you to report them to. Off the top of my head, I can't remember how many scores you get for free. I believe it's five or six. So make sure that you know which schools you want to send them to if you have a list longer than six. Once you report them, schools will see your scores. And the schools that you send them to will not be able to see what other schools you send them to. So if you sent them to the University of South Carolina, that's great. They'll see your score, but they won't see that you also sent it to uh, North Carolina or NC State. So they're just going to see the scores as you see them. As far as the scores go, make sure that you give yourself at least two weeks before the due date of your school's uh, application. This is very important because you're going to get your verbal and your quantitative scores on the spot. You're going to see those scores before you walk out of the building. However, you're going to need to give these scores some time in order to grade your writing sections. 
And generally speaking, that takes about two weeks. So you want to make sure that you give your scores enough time to be able to get those scores into your school before the due date. Because if your GRE is not in by the due date, then that's considered an uh, incomplete application. And you don't want your application to graduate school to be missed because you took the GRE too late. Very important, know each school's target score. We talked about this a little bit at the beginning. Know what your school is looking for. Know what section your school is looking for as far as which section they're looking at the hardest. So if you are looking for a business school, more likely than not, they're going to be looking at your quantitative section more than they're going to be looking at your verbal section. If you're in social science, more likely than not, they're going to be looking at your verbal section over your quantitative section. So knowing which one to focus on will also help you with your studies, knowing which one to really, really focus on. And also knowing what level of score your school is looking for. If your school is looking for a low 160, it's good to know what your target is so that you uh, don't necessarily get freaked out that you are looking for like a 168, 169, and all of a sudden you see a 164 on test day. Knowing what your school is looking for is good for you. Again, a lot of times these schools will report these online. If you don't see them online, you can always give the graduate school admissions a call or your subjects um, admissions a call to see what kind of scores they're looking for. Do you know that you do have the right to not report your scores. If you feel that something happened during your test or you feel you just weren't right that day and you don't feel like you did all that well, it is totally up to you to report or not. If you don't want to, that's okay. No one is forcing you to. Okay, so just make sure that you know that when you go into the test and they're asking to the report, if you feel like it, it just didn't go so well, that's okay, you don't have to report them, you'll just have to take them again. If you do decide to take the test, a second time you need to wait at least three weeks after you took the first test. So it's probably a good idea to give yourself at minimum a month and a half before your uh, graduate school application is due to take your first test, just in case you do need to retake. That'll give you that three week window along with that two weeks to provide the uh, scores to score your written sections. All right, so just a little bit of tidying up here. Um, my name is Jordan Jacobe. I have provided my email here. If you want these slides, if you have any questions of me, if you wanna go over anything in more detail, we can do that. Also, I do hold GRE study sessions at least once a year. I try to do them each semester. Sometimes it just doesn't happen, but in these GRE study sessions, they tend to run longer. So I tend to run them over a few days where we tackle the writing section in one day, where we tackle the math section in one day, where we tackle the verbal section in one day. So if you feel like you would like more info from me, you can reach out to me through my email or be on the lookout for those study sessions. And then we'll go more in depth as to how to study, what to study, and we'll do a little bit of studying and practice in those sessions too. So if this is of interest to you, be on the lookout or contact me directly and we can see if we can set something up. So I hope that this session didn't scare you too much. I hope you feel more prepared for the GRE. I hope you're uh, ready to at least get on the uh, study train in order to uh, start studying well for this. Again, if you have any questions of me, um, feel free to email me if you be on the lookout for those study sessions. And I wish you good luck in your graduate school applications. Hello, everybody. 
I'm glad to see you. Today, I'm going to talk about getting into law school. I know about 20 people at Allen University who talk about going to law school. So I want to tell you how. Share my screen here. So what do all these people have in common? Besides the fact that they look very, very happy, they are all lawyers here in the United States, along with, uh, well, our President Biden, our past President Obama, our Vice President Kamala Harris. All lawyers, all went to law school, all took the LSAT. That's what I want to tell you about right now. The first thing you have to do is register with LSAC, Law School Admission Council. Now, law school isn't like other grad schools. You don't apply to the University of Georgia School of Sociology or Counseling or Psychology. You don't do that with law school. You don't directly correspond with any law school. You work everything through LSAC. So the first thing you need to do is register with LSAC. Next thing you need to do is prepare for the LSAT, the law school admission test for about six months. That's what Howard University says. You need to take that LSAT, that test multiple times with the last being a year before entering law school. For instance, if you wanna to go to law school in the fall of 2022, after you graduate from Allen in May of 2022, then you wanna start taking that LSAT in 2021 with the last one being September of 2021, one year before you wanna enter law school. And then after you take the LSAT, you wanna work on your application, which should include a personal statement and you get your letters of recommendation. Now let's look at some law schools that some Allen students have been interested in because do you qualify? Well, I think you will notice from this chart that you do. Here's a list of the law schools on the far left, then where they're located, and then you have the GPA and the LSAT. That's the test score, that's the median test score. What does median mean? That means right in the middle. You have another chart there with another place in the chart is 75%. So in the upper 75%, you can see they have a little bit of higher GPA in LSAT. And the last column is the 25%. So they have a little bit of lower GPA in LSAT. What you wanna aim for is that median, the GPA in the median range, the LSAT score in the median range. Now, the LSAT, like everything else in this world, is changing a little bit because of COVID. And in response to that, they're changing the test. They're making an LSAT flex test, which you can do at home because it's remotely proctored. It's a little bit shorter than the regular LSATs. Now, the LSAT is also being scheduled and will remain online, remote proctored, but and we're going to return to that big test that has a fourth part. The LSAT Flex has three parts. Here then are some of the dates. The first April uh, is the first LSAT Flex test. Then in June, there's a Flex test. Then in August, there's an LSAT. October, there's an LSAT. So you will find all of this on that LSAC site that you're all going to be registering for. And you keep practicing the LSAT test because you can get good at the little games they play. There's what's called a logic game section. Here's an example of a question in the logic game uh, section which if you keep practicing, as I say, you can get good at it. Here's the, here's the question. Exactly three films, greed, 
Harvest, and Limelight are shown during the Film Club's festival held on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Each film is shown at least once during the festival, but never more than once on a given day. On each day, at least one film is shown. Films are shown one at a time. The following conditions apply. On Thursday, Harvest is shown and no film is shown after it on that day. Now, what you wanna do is get out a little piece of paper, start writing these down, and you'll be able to then answer the question that follows what's, on, what's gonna be shown on a particular night. So you can see, you get in, you develop the skill by going over it and over it. And of course, the test is timed. So you wanna get pretty quick at it. Now, Khan Academy gives free prep materials online that you can keep practicing and get good at to get that good LSAT score. As it says here, they want to help you build the skills you need to reach your LSAT goals. They're free, high quality resources. They're now used by 60,000 students each month. I know some students from Allen who went on these sites and got good at taking the test. So just to conclude, here is the LSAC. That's the first thing you want to do. And then the other thing you want to do is email me. My name is Nancy Rhodes. That is ngrhodes at allenuniversity.com. I will answer any questions. I'll send you some practice tests. Because if you want to go to law school, let's get started. Let's get there. Thanks.